Amen. Amen. Take your Bible, if you would, please. Turn to 2 Timothy. I know the Bible. I know where all the books are, but for some reason I can't find it in my Bible this morning. Well, I tell you what, the devil's working on me hard. Maybe, maybe it has something to do with the message. Um, 2 Timothy. Ah, I found it. Found it. Everybody calm down now. Um, this message this morning, I promise you, uh, is either from the Lord, <laughs> and I wouldn't say from the devil because it's the word of God, but it ain't from me because when I was thinking about the, the main verse that I was going to focus on, the main area of the Bible I was going to preach on, God took it a whole different direction. Okay, now uh, I've been preaching here lately uh, a series of messages about being taken out of bondage and the journey to the promised land and then entering into the promised land. In our life, um, the Apostle Paul told us that these things are written for our admonition and learning. Uh, we read these stories in the Bible. And, and the thought occurred to me this morning uh, on over how many times did Israel, be, the time they left, the time they finally got into the promised land, how many times did they absolutely blow it before God? They just, they just absolutely rebelled against God. Well, they did it. Uh, they did it as soon as they left. When God is to lead them by the Red Sea and camp by the Red Sea. They then, then they cross the Red Sea. They see they were looking at fish, deep sea fish, through the water. They were walking on dry ground, looking at water, straight on like this. They saw the smoke rise up from Mount Sinai. They saw they heard the sound of the trumpets. They saw the fire of God burning up there. They heard the voice of God himself up there on Mount Sinai. And they said, oh, please, Moses, for, from now on, you go find out what God wants to say and then come say it to us. Don't, we can't handle that voice anymore. They heard that voice. They still rebelled because when Moses went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, he comes back down. They're having a big, nasty party. They made another god out of gold, and they're saying, you know what, let's go back to Egypt. And then, I mean, they just did it again. With the, They complained about the bread, they complained about the water. God sent fiery serpents among them. Then you have, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, uh, the, the one who led the rebellion. Huh? Uh, Korah. Yeah, Korah. Led a rebellion. And you got people be part of this. And then they saw the ground open up and swallow core and 250 people up. And they're going, okay, we're on Moses' side. And they just over and over again. And how many times did God let them go back to Egypt? There's something to that. I don't know exactly what it is yet. But that's, that's the thought that came to me this morning. Is that God never let them go back. Uh, some of them didn't make it. Some of them didn't make it. A lot of them didn't make it. Most of them didn't make it. But uh, anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 2. When, when I was reading um, Exodus chapter 14, which I believe we'll be going to... Wait a minute. That's not the place I want you to go. Here we go. Proverbs 23. I'm sorry. Even my notes are messed up this morning. You pray for me. I mean it. I call this message the relapse. When, whenever you have an addiction issue, whether it's alcohol, drugs, uh, pornography or adultery, uh, or anything like that, there's always the possibility that you will, you will relapse. You'll go back to it. That's in the Bible. And uh, I, haven't, 
I haven't heard this verse preached on in a long time. In Proverbs chapter 23, we're going to start in verse 29. And the Bible says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? You know what that means, don't you? This is, it's referring to drink, strong drink, alcohol. One guy told me, he said, Mike, there's a boxing glove in every bottle. Isn't that true? With some people. Some people are sorrowful drunks. When they get drunk, they cry on everybody. Some people are uh, adulterous drunks. When they get drunk, uh, they're just looking for the next person to sleep with. And then there are those who are fighting drunks. You don't want to mess with them because they'll knock your head off. And that's what that's talking about. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? That's probably one of the things, Cubby, if I'm right, that you, when you uh, pulled somebody over that you thought might have been drunk, it was their speech. Where is Cubby? Ah! Boy, my mind is messed up this morning. I thought Robert was cubby. Yeah. But anyway, um, they listen to that person's speech, and if they're slurring their speech, they know that probably they got a drunk. Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? And verse 30 says, They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. In other words, it's pure poison. Pure poison. Some people just have it in them to where... Maybe they can handle their liquor. That's, that's not a good thing. Because then that gives them a reason to drink more. But then there are those who cannot handle it. And to them it is absolute poison. They will do things that they would never normally do. And that's because of the poison that is in their system. And he's referring to alcohol. Now, for those of you that uh, are curious, I've got, I've got a couple messages online. I know they're on YouTube, they're on Sermon Audio, uh, about drunkenness, about uh, alcohol, about um, physical drunkenness and spiritual drunkenness. There is a connection. And uh, when Rodney Howard Brown comes into town, he seeks to bring everybody to a spiritual drunkenness. They call him the Holy Ghost bartender. And that's, I mean, he, that, man is, that man is a dirty devil. He's one of these big millionaire preachers. Makes millions of dollars every year. He brings a drunken spirit, holy laughter, uh, altered states of consciousness. He brings that kind of drunkenness to people who've not even touched wine or strong drink but they act like they are drunk and it's because they have a spirit in them and it's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not cause you to act drunk. The Bible says be sober, be vigilant for you adversary the devil. What does that tell you? That tells you that if you're drunk, you will not notice the devil is right near you and he's fixing to tear your head off. Now verse 3, Thine eyes shall behold strange women. There's your adulterer drunks right there. And thine heart shall utter perverse things. That's that bar talk. Uh, tavern jokes. They're always dirty jokes, filthy jokes, filthy talking. Thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. 
You wake up one day and you got bruises all over you. How did that happen? I don't know. When shall I awake? And then notice what I have underlined. I will seek it yet again. That is the body and the mind and I guess maybe the spirit's desire to return back to the thing that you asked God to release you from. Now, I mentioned this morning that I prayed one time and God fixed our streaming problem. I don't think that every prayer I pray or every prayer that you pray, well, as soon as you pray it, God's going to give immediate answer. Sometimes He does, but I don't think He does sometimes. Sometimes it is a process that God is going to take you through. And if anybody says that they recovered from some addiction and that they never wanted to go back or they never went back. Maybe they did, I don't know. But the desire to go back like dogs to vomit, the desire to go back is strong. In fact, I have that verse in my notes. It is very strong and it's something that every born-again child of God who is wanting to go from Egypt to the promised land, even if you're not addicted to anything, it's still, there are times, people, there are times, I'm going to be honest with you, when I felt like giving up, walking out. It happens to me. It's happened to other people. It's a strong tug. And it's, and it's something I think God is, I don't know, for some reason this is the way God took the message. So I'm going to mind the Lord this morning. So I'm going to talk about the relapse. Let's pray. Father, I need your help to preach this morning. Uh, Lord, I just, I'm asking for your grace. Asking for mercy. This morning I'm asking God, Lord, that you take over. You be the messenger. You, you're the one, it's your word. You're the one who has the right to open it up to the minds and hearts of these people. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for this book. I thank you for what it says. It warns us of things that can happen. It foretells us, Father, things that could be just around the corner. The words that it speaks applied directly to our heart gives us this knowledge that, Father, you know what's in our path and you're trying to warn us you're trying to help us and you're trying to prepare us along the way father I understand Lord that without the shed blood of Jesus Christ that I would not be able to stand behind this pulpit and preach this message this morning so father I thank you Lord for the blood of Christ I thank you for the mercy that you have had on me I thank you, God, that though I've fallen, you've always helped me to stand back up and to keep going forward. Father, give us help. Give us understanding of your word. Help all of us, Father, who have left Egypt and we want desperately to make it to the promised land. But there's always going to be something standing in our way. Lord, help us, we pray this morning in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Now, take your Bible, turn to Exodus. This is the chapter that I was going to preach on because uh, I've preached on this a couple times. And to me, this story is, um, it, it goes to show you the providence of God. By providence, I mean that God is always 100% in charge of everything that happens to you every single day. Do you believe that? Now, I've mentioned before that there is, there is God's will. Uh, and the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But obviously, not everybody is going to be saved. 
But God wants them to be saved. It is God's will that they be saved. I, I, he, he sent Jesus for God so loved a tiny fraction of the world. No, the whole world. God, God uh, loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave Him for everybody that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's offering of His Son was for everybody, but His knowledge knows that not everybody is going to receive Him. So there is God's will, because God is a good God. He doesn't want the lost to perish. He doesn't want lost people to burn in hell. He created hell for the devil and his angels. Now he's got to throw his special creation, man, into that, into that pit. He's got to throw him in there, and he don't want to. So he sent Jesus to come and die and pay the price for us so that all who would would come to him and be saved, be born again, and be with him. And God will not have to throw you into the pit. Amen. But it doesn't work out that way with a lot of people. Some people, you try and 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 they're just not going to make it. And when we look at Israel... Out of some 600 or so thousand people that left Egypt. Of those people that left Egypt. Two of them entered into the promised land. You say, well, what, what happened to everybody else? God walked them in the wilderness 40 years till they all died. And their offspring, their children went into the promised land. But they were born in the wilderness. They were not born in Egypt. And... All, the only two were Joshua and Caleb because they didn't, they came back with the report from being spying on the Canaan land and said, we can go in there. God's going to kill those giants. Don't worry about it. They had faith. They trusted in God. God allowed them to go into the promised land. But the rest of those who left Egypt perished in the wilderness. Well, that's something, isn't it? That's what kind of ratio is that? That is, that's just beyond comprehension that out of over half a million people, only two were saved. Only two. So, in Exodus 14, I want you to notice something. If I, I didn't put a map, I don't have a map this morning, but if you have a map in your Bible, and you can find a map that shows Egypt and the Promised Land... Uh, and uh, Jerusalem and so on. And you can look. And there's a, there's a pretty short way that they can go to get into the promised land. They can cross the Nile River and just follow the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and they can be right there. But that's not how God had them go. God, remember, God's the one leading them. And while they, Moses may have said, okay, boys, we're gonna, we're gonna follow the coast up here and it just be a few weeks and we'll be up there. Won't take us long at all. God had a different thing in mind. In Exodus 14, the Bible says, and the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth, between Migdal and the sea over against Baal Zephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. Now, um, God had them go over to what amounted to the west coast of the, um, of the Red Sea and camp there. Now, that area is a mountainous area. And in that area, you have one trail that goes in and one way out. So God basically told Moses, have them take this road and go camp over by the Red Sea and stop right there. Now what God was doing was God led them into a trap. Believe it or not. Because then, well let's, let's keep reading here. Verse 3, for Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are, what's that word? Entangled. Guess what I'm going to preach on this morning? In the land, the wilderness hath shut them in. 
Pharaoh says, oh my goodness, boy, did they mess up. They're over there against the Red Sea. They've got no, I know that area. They've got no way out. If I go over there through that road, through the mountains that they, that they went through, I can get them easily because now that they're there by the sea, they can't get out. I'm going to send every chariot I got. I'm going to send every bloodthirsty soldier that I have. I'm going to lead the charge and we're going to kill every one of them pesky Jews. Now, let me tell you something. This is on the side this morning. It's not part of the message, but I want to tell you something. When I hear in this country people leading the chant from the river to the sea, that is a cry that they want the Palestinians to push every Jew into the Mediterranean Sea and have them slaughtered. When I hear that kind of talk coming out of our college campuses, when I hear that kind of talk coming out of our public schools, when I hear that talk coming out of Senators and congressmen and people in this country. I'm telling you, we're but a few steps away of turning into Nazi Germany. And I'll tell you something. I do not want to be against God's side when His judgment and His wrath is poured out on those who despise Israel. Somebody say amen. Amen. Because how, how, we know how this story turns out, don't we? What is Pharaoh in his mind? What, he thinks he's going to kill the Jews. He doesn't know that God's going to kill him. But this, this whole thing here is God leading Israel into a trap. And you might say, well, why would God do that? I'll show it to you in a minute. I will heart, listen to verse 4. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. That he shall follow after them. Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Who's in charge of Pharaoh? Who's in charge of Moses? Who's in charge of the Pharaoh's soldiers? God. Who's in charge of the people of Israel? God. Who's in charge of everything that happens? God. Good or bad. Righteous or unrighteous. Saint or sinner, God's in charge of it all. Did we pray yet? I'm going to pray. Listen, I'm telling you, I don't, I don't know where, what's going on in my mind, but I'm going to pray again. Father, I need your help this morning. Lord, I don't know what's wrong. I don't know what's going on. I don't feel bad. I feel wonderful. I feel good. Uh, but Father, Lord, the devil, I guess, is just withstanding me. And so, Lord, would you bless this message for my people's sake, for your kingdom's sake, God, for your name's sake. Bless this message. Help me to preach it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Now, verse 4 again. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Pharaoh still doesn't believe in Moses' God. So God says, I'm fixing to fix that. They're fixing to find out that I and I alone am the only God that there really is. There is no other God beside me. There's no God higher than me. There's no God that can touch me. I am the God of everything that happens. And I want you to understand that. We had a bad week this week. And it was a bad week. And it took its toll on me. I'm telling you, man, man, I was just burdened. Took its toll on my family. Probably others that I don't know about in this church or online. May have had a bad week. But I'm here to tell you, God was in charge of everything that there was. In fact, let's go back to that Proverbs 16, if you would. Turn to Proverbs 16. <clears throat> Remember that verse about the, uh, the lot? Proverbs sixteen thirty three, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Now, I want you to think, every one of you this morning, I want you to think of the terrible 
rotten, nasty, evil, dirty things that you did before you got saved. I want you to think of them just for a minute. Now, I don't want you to dwell on them now. I just want you to think of them. I want you to remember the rotten, awful sins that you committed before God saved you or before God got in your life or maybe you were saved or maybe you thought you were saved but uh, anyway God had to bring you to a place where he could break you and mold you in his shape I want you to remember that time and we look back and we just something we just close our eyes and say God God oh forgive me God please forgive me and you've asked God a thousand times to forgive you over and over. The same sin over and over. God, forgive me for that. God, I wish I'd never done that. God, I wish I was never part of that. God, I wish I had never said that. I wish I'd never been a partaker of these things. God, I wish it had never happened. I wish I wasn't born. And yet, the truth of it is, it was that plus everything else that happened in your life that brought you to the cross of Jesus Christ. So who's disposing of it? What was it when you did all those terrible things, when you were rebelling against God, when you're out there sinning, you're out there enjoying it, you're out there doing all this evil stuff, who's disposing of it? Was it, was it the devil that did it? Was it uh, the devil's angels that did it? Uh, was it the Democrats that did it to you? Or what? What was it? It was God. God is the one who led you to the camp Next, right next to the Red Sea, brought over Pharaoh, your biggest enemy. Pharaoh's going to kill you and you know it. So here you are. Here's the Red Sea. Here's Pharaoh. But what is it that we know about Pharaoh at this point in time? He can't get in. Why? Huh? God put his pillar of fire and cloud right there. And held him back. If God really meant for the Israelites to be killed by Pharaoh, he would have removed that cloud and they would have killed him. But you see, that wasn't God's plan. They just thought it was God's plan. You just thought God had drug you along and now, after all these years of serving him, he hates you and he's not, he's not gonna uh, have anything to do with you anymore. He's gonna drop you like a hot potato. He's not, he is gonna turn his back on you. All the years of service that you've done, all the things you've tried to live for the Lord, and you blew it, you backslid, you got entangled again, you had a relapse or whatever it was, you turned your back on God, and then you think, God, why did you turn your back on me? God, why are you going to send me to hell? God's not sending you to hell. God's got a plan for your life. He's got something He's going to do for you. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Entangled. What does that word mean? Entangled. What does that word mean? Gary, what does that word mean? Literally, what does it mean? If my wife's hair is entangled, she, it's not bondage. Just a twisted, tangled up, not right we can't even hardly, we can't describe entangled without using the word tangle <laughs> okay but we know what it means okay it's all got junk tangled up in it like she fell in a in a weed or a or a um, haystack and it's got hay all stuck in her hair and she can't get it out that's entangled now look at what the Pharisees did here in Matthew 22. Remember, the Pharisees are on whose side? The devil's or God's? They're on the devil's side. They're not on God's side. They hate Jesus. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his what? What is God's talk? It's his word. Now, let me ask you a question. Has men tried to pervert this word and add false teaching, false doctrine, false words into it? Has men tried to do that? Have they succeeded? In some of the translations, yeah, they have. But in this one, have they succeeded? No, it's still the same Bible. I can, listen, we got a 1611 King James Bible somewhere around here. And you can, is it right there? You can come up here and compare any verse that you want to with this 400 and some odd year old Bible, 413, 12 year old Bible right there. And I guarantee you it'll say the exact same thing. 
God has not ever let anybody entangle the words of God. Somebody say amen. But the devil is always trying to entangle God's word. And so sometimes you'll be in a fix, man. You'll be all messed up and you'll try to remember a verse or something like that and you remember it wrong and the devil's tried to entangle God's word in your mind and you think, well, that's no help to me at all. When you open the Bible, then you find out you had it all wrong anyway. And when you read it right, then all of a sudden, God's power comes on you and He sets you free. He detangles it. Amen. Look at, in fact, turn to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast. Come on, let me hear those pages. It's your Bible. It's your eternal salvation. Do what you want with it. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke. See, Gary, you were right. With the yoke of bondage. Amen. God is saying to, God is saying to you this morning that if you'll stand fast in His liberty that He's given you, that when sin approaches, when temptation comes, I promise you, you have a way out. And he calls upon all of us to stand fast and be not entangled again with all that sin that we used to be entangled with and part of. Who in here really does want to go back to the old ways and the old days and live that life all over again? I don't. I don't, I don't know anybody that would. Well, you know what? I'd get, I, that's wrong. I had a, I had a friend of mine in, in Bible college. And we were very good friends. His name was Todd. And Todd and I, well, I mean, we got along. He was about, about eight years older than me. And we got along really well. And every now and then I would hear him say something like, like we would go out to eat somewhere at a buffet or something like that. And he would say, oh, right now is about the time I wish I could have a cigarette. And I'd just look at him, and he would start talking about the old days, how he used to like to enjoy a cigarette after he ate a big meal like that. And then he started talking about the drugs that him and his brother did. And then he started talking about the other things that him and other people used to do. And I'm going, man, you shouldn't want that. When I left that Bible college, another friend of mine informed me that secretly he was a queer. He was a sodomite. I never knew it. I never saw it. He never approached me at all. But all that desire that he had to go back to those sins, the only thing keeping him from it at that time, I guess, was me. I don't know. When I left his life... And I guess he figured he would make himself accountable to me without knowing it. When I left his life, he went downhill. And he's still that way. That I know of. I don't want to go back and I don't want to talk about how good those days were. Because they're not good. Amen. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever ye are justified by the law, ye are, look at that phrase, fallen from grace. That's what you're doing. You're getting tangled up back in the old sins and the bondage of those sins. You're tangled up in it again because you relapsed. You decided to go back. You decided a little bit wouldn't hurt. But it does. It won't work, people. It won't work. Second Timothy chapter 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong how? Yourself? Your flesh? Do you, do you honestly think that the things that you do, as far as your sin is concerned, that you could honestly stop doing it by your own strength? No! I don't care what Joel Osteen preaches. I don't care what Joyce Meyer says. I don't care. They all say that if you think positive thoughts and say positive words, then you will drive away all those negative things that hit you in life and you will never sin again, ever. That's a lie. It's a setup. It's, it is the 
devil uses that kind of preaching to set people up so that when they fall, they think, oh, I must not be good enough for God. So then what are they going to do after that? Go right back to it like dogs to vomit. He said, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now listen, one of the reasons why, and I mentioned this a while ago in prayer, one of the reasons why you go through some of the things that you're going through is because five years down the road, seven years down the road, a year down the road, you're going to be able to share your testimony with somebody else who is having a rough time, somebody who's a drunk, somebody who's a, a dope addict, somebody who's got mental problems, somebody who's, I mean, whatever they're addicted to, whatever part of sin plays in their life, you can tell them with an honest face, listen, I know this sounds weird, but let me tell you what God did for me. I used to be exactly like you, but God changed my life. God turned me around. God made the difference in my life. And you can use that. Look at what he says here. The thing that you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. How do you think I got to this place? Men that I looked up to, uh, teachers that I had, Sunday school teachers, uh, that I, when I was a boy, when I was a teenager, preachers that I heard preach, men, godly men that I looked up to, I followed in their path, listened to the things that they said, went through the trials that they went through. They helped me get to where I am now. I can't brag on anything. It's something that God did. Verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth. There's that word. Look at it. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Let me, let me say this. I, I'll get off this very quickly. I've said it so many times, especially when COVID came around. Quit worrying about everything that's going on in this world. Some of you may need to quit watching the news. Because all it did for me was just about drive me nuts. And I mean it. I'm not joking. I kept worrying about what was going to happen. What was going to, how things were going to turn out. How bad it was. And all it did for me was make me afraid. I don't like it. I've got a battle to fight. Number one, for myself. Number two, for my family. Number three, for my church. Number four, for all of those who call me pastor. For all the good people in Kenya. I've got a battle to fight for all of them. And if I'm all messed up and entangled with who's going to win what. Who's gonna, how things are going to turn out in this country. What's going to happen uh, with, with this war going on in the if I, if I tangle myself up in that, I won't be any good to anybody. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who he hath chosen him to be a soldier. God called you to be a soldier of the Lord. God called you to be on his side. God called you to be a saint. That means bother yourself and worry yourself and conduct yourself as, as far as the affairs of the Word of God, get in your Bible. Get in your Bible. And you won't have, to, you won't have time to worry about all this other stuff. Um, 2 Peter chapter 2. Oh, turn there, please. 2 Peter chapter 2. You know what I'm afraid of this morning? I'm afraid of I don't have enough scripture passages to keep you for another three hours. Second Peter chapter two. I didn't hear what was said. I probably don't need to. All right. 
Yeah, I, I know some by heart, so yeah. Second Peter, if you look at Second Peter uh, chapter 2, if you look at the very first verse, you get an idea of what this is about. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Believe it or not, the devil has preachers that he has trained to try to keep people from reaching the promised land. Did he not mention, and J.R. reminded me of the name, Korah. The, it's called the gainsaying of Korah. That story where Korah, Moses' first cousin, took, uh, took it upon himself, and he had 250 people on his side, and he said, Behold Israel, listen to me all Israel. Who is it that said that Moses has to be in charge all the time? Why, God, I think God's called me to be in charge. I think God wants me to lead you all. In fact, this Moses has led you in a circle in the wilderness all these years and you've got nowhere. I can lead you back into Egypt where in Egypt they'll take us back. No, they're going to kill you as soon as you, as soon as you get over there. They're going to kill you. And you know the story that Moses said, okay, everybody, it, here's what we'll do. If God doesn't do anything... In the next few hours, then you follow Korah, and I'll get out of the way. But if God does something brand new, if God opens up the earth and swallows up Korah and all of his people all at once, then you'll know not to follow Korah. Pretty simple, wasn't it? All of a sudden, the ground opened up right then and swallowed up Korah and 250 people and all their tents and everything with them. And everybody's watching this, eyes like this, going, OMG. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. Moses, we're behind you 100%. Oh, we're going to follow Moses. That's how that story turned out. And there are people that are designed to try to keep you, try to preach you back into Egypt. Because the devil doesn't want you being free. Amen. So, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. Promise them liberty is these, here, here, these, these college students now who are so spoiled, they're spoiled brats. They have, they're entitled. They think that they have a right to everything. They think that they have a right for the government, which means you to pay their $400,000 school bill so that they can go to college to learn how to speak French and talk about French poetry that nobody cares about, get a degree in that, and then get they're mad now because the, this world is going to make them work and earn, the, earn a living for themselves. Well, they should just give them money. And you have, you have college students who actually believe that in their mind. They're promising them, listen, Joe Biden and his corrupt team is promising them liberty. They're promising transgendered, sodomite, uh, queer, tra listen, it's LG, le lesbian, gay, bi, queer, transgendered, pedophiles. They're promising them liberty. Hey, get on our side and, and we'll just make everybody bow down for you and you can have liberty. In fact, we'll give you all the jobs. We'll give you everything. They promise them liberty. But they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought in bondage. For if after, look at verse 20. If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world... Through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again, what? Entangled therein. And overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Listen, I want to say in, in, in all the love that I can say. And I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to add some grace to this. The Bible says a just man falleth seven times and ariseth again. 
It happens. Backsliding happens. Um, relapsing happens. When I was um, going through the mandatory meetings that I had to go to when I was uh, hooked on all those pain meds, there was a young man in our, in our group that I didn't know it at the time, but he really, he really took to me. The last day that you're in the, 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 the class that I was in was run by a Christian man. God, God sent me a Christian man to help me through that. And I was, I was just delighted in that. But the last day that you're going to be there, um, they go around the table and they have everybody in the group say something to you to encourage you. Or, you know, something that they've liked about you and so on. And when it came time to this young man, I forgot what his name was. It may have been Brian, but he said, I want you to know, Mike. He said, I have never heard anybody talk the way you talk. And, and the things that you have said, he says, really, really helped me. And I'm just bawling. And I said, well, I appreciate that. I got his phone number. And... I've called him a few times just to see how he is. That same day, when I left um, the building we were in, up in South County, I got in my car and I took off. And I noticed he was walking down 21 toward uh, 270. And I, I put, kind of pulled over and stopped and I said, Hey, do you, do you need a ride somewhere? He said, no, I'm fine. He said, I'm, it's just a short walk. He said, I'll be fine. And I said, are you sure? I, would, I don't have any place to go. I said, I'd just like to spend time with you. And, you know, I can drop you off anywhere you want to. It doesn't matter to me. He said, no, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I said, well, okay. I said, well, you know, stay in touch with me. He said, okay. That afternoon, the group leader, Raleigh was his name, he called me. And he said, you remember Brian? I said, yeah. He said, um, when he left, he stopped at the gas station and bought a pint of liquor. He was an alcoholic. And he said he, he had drank the whole thing. And I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, he's in the hospital now. We've got him in hospital treatment now. By the time George, I'd caught up with him on the road, he had already drank that pint. And he didn't want to get in my car because he knew he was drunk. It happens. Sin happens to Christian people. All of us have these things to deal with, do we not? Be careful. Fight against them. Because the reason that happened... Let me, let me read this to you and I'll show you why it happened. Verse 20, for if after they've escaped the pollutions of this world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. God's telling you right now that whatever lie the devil's trying to tell you about going back, it's not true. It, things won't be better if you go get drunk again. Things won't be better. If you take some more drugs, it won't be better. It'll be worse. And you're sitting in God's house now by His grace. But be careful. You could be in bondage again. And the second time is worse than the beginning. He said, it had been better for them had they not known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That bottle, those drugs, that porn, those women, those men, that chat that you get into, all of that stuff is a way to entangle 
church people. Do you believe that? I wonder if the truth was really known in America, how many church people are entangled in the bondage of their sin. And I mean, just, they can't get away from it. I bet the number's pretty high. But it's like going to your own vomit again. It's not what you thought it would be. It's worse. Um, I told you I had no, no more verses. Let me, let me do this one thing. Some of you have already heard this, but some haven't, so I'm going to preach it again. Turn to Judges, if you would, please. Judges. Turn to the uh, second chapter of Judges. Now, let me tell you why that after, after you said, I'm quitting, I'm done, it's over with, never going to do that again, never going to say that again, never going to be part of this again, it happened again. And I want you to understand, I'm not giving you a, an excuse or a license for you to go out and do whatever you want to. Well, Brother Mike said, that helps me. No, no, I didn't. Because you got to worry about something. Now that you're a son of God, you know what you got to worry about? A ten and a half foot long rod. Or maybe a, I won't call it a rod, I'll call it what my mama called it. A switch. And my mama said that when she was young, her mama said, you go out and cut your own switch. And if you came in with a bad switch, and she had to go out and cut it for you, you got it worse. Oh, that would be horrible. Oh, somebody should have turned your mama in for child abuse. Listen, I'm tell I want to tell you something. As a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, here's what all you have to worry about in going back to your old sin is God's rod. If you can handle God's rod, knock yourself out. But I guarantee you, God's got a rod bigger than your desire to go back to your sin. I, listen, I promise you He does. He will beat the fire out of you. And you'll say, you know what? I, I'm not doing that again. Not doing it. So in Joshua uh, chapter... Um, judges, you, excuse me, Judges. Uh, I want you to look at chapter 3, verse 1. These are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, to prove. Now, if I were to ask everybody to raise your hand, who's going to heaven? Probably everybody raise your hand. All right, that's good. But who's really going to heaven? Okay, well, there's always proof. There's always proof. The Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. You see, Joshua and his men fought the war of Canaan. That means that the land that they got, they got it with their with the blood of their brothers, the blood of their fathers, the blood of their sons. They got it uh, through the blood of their neighbors and their kindred. And they fought and died and shed blood so that others could live. Listen, that sounds like America, doesn't it? I think, I think of World War II and I think, listen, the, the more they harp against Israel, the Jews, the more I think we're fixing to fight World War II all over again. Only I don't know how it's all going to turn out. But I'm telling you that we had men back in those days. We had, we had boys, 17-year-old boys that lied about their age so they could go and fight for the freedom that we hold dear in this land. Amen. We want to be free and we want to keep it that way. And so... Um, there was now that now that all that generation had died off, all the World War II guys are almost all gone now. My uncle was 96. He died two years ago. Um, he was a Marine. He was still mowing his grass, Chris. He was mowing his grass two weeks before he died. That's tough. That's a Marine. Amen. But anyway, 
Um, only that the, watch this in verse 2. Only that the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. In plain, simple language, God is going to teach you how to fight. Not fight people. How to fight spirits. How to fight your flesh. How to fight that old crowd that wants you back. How to fight your own desires, your own impulses, the old things you used to do. This is how you fight. You fight, you study, you fight. And God honors that. And God's training you. Because you're going to train somebody else one of these days. Somebody else is going to come to you. Man, I got a bad problem. I know how to fix that problem. It's as simple as calling on the name of the Lord. That's what God's doing. That's why you relapse. That's why you fell back into it. That's why you turned around. That's why you wanted to go back. That's, that's why those things happened. And God has either proven that you're not who you said you are, that you're a fake and a phony, and everybody's going to find out about it. And we've had that happen. Since I was a kid, I've seen people that I thought, man, they were, they were rock solid. Gone. To this day, gone. But then there is people that they fought and God blessed them. And they still stand to this day. That's what I'd like to see out of you. That's what I want you to see out of me. So I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight me. I'm going to fight the things that want to entangle me. And then I'm going to fight for you. Will you do that for me? Let's, let's pray.